Okay, uh, so first disclaimer, obviously I'm not a scientist. Second disclaimer, um, uh, one of my best friends teaches a course on PowerPoint and I was asking her the other day, I'm doing my first PowerPoint presentation, uh, can you give me any tips? And she's like, don't read the slides. Uh, guess what? <laughs> um, okay, how does this thing work? Let's see. Right, has reality put science fiction out of business? This is a question a lot of us science fiction writers have been asking ourselves lately. Why do we ask this? This is really bad, right? A lot of really bad stuff happening. Um, I'm not even gonna go there on this, but you guys would know what I'm talking about. In better news, here's a, a slide that I, I just went and Googled around like last week and I just looked for science related headlines and you can see all of these things that look like science fiction you really couldn't tell the difference whether this is science fiction or reality I reckon and, and I could very easily have put together maybe another 10 of these without any effort at all so it's kind of a problem um, for those of us writing science fiction you know what do we do now because it's all coming true well I think the real question is what is science fiction most broadly, it's a literature of the imagination. Do we really need more imagination these days? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, this right here is what I'm talking about. So this is a famous quote from Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. And then we got this guy, again, over whom we draw a veil. But th there's a real issue ab about imagination and knowledge right now. There's a real issue about knowledge. I think we're at risk of losing both. And I think that we need both. And why do I think that? Did you guys see this story? Um, B.O.B.? <laughs> I, I don't know what you say. And Neil deGrasse Tyson tried to talk to him, and he tried to explain non-Euclidean geometry, and, you know, B.O.B. is just not interested. Um, and, and the thing is, it's not, I'm not just picking on him. There, there are a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of people that don't believe in in knowledge and institutions, and there's a kind of whole breakdown, I think, going on right now uh, about people not trusting anything and believing what they read on the internet. So I would argue that imagination without knowledge is more than foolish, it's dangerous. And here we go for your science fiction. I mean, we have a situation of weaponized information right now. Uh, here's another example, right? This is, this is from the New York Times, uh, Twitter manipulating the election, and this is just the surface of it. This is not conspiracy series, this is not a Philip K. Dick novel, this is like our world right now. So, science fiction got out in front of the information age. It has the remit to address larger cultural issues that science just cannot handle because the problems need to be too narrow. Now, this is Octavia Butler, who is very sadly missed. She died too young and uh, her novel, Parable of the Talents, came out in 1998. And these are the, some of the things that were in it. Uh, they're all listed there. Um, Make America Great Again. So she had a, a presidential candidate called Andrew Steele, I think. And that was his campaign slogan. But science fiction, although it can be predictive, that's not really what it's designed for. A lot of people think that it is, but I would say no. Um, it, Okay, we're gonna skip to my brother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, so I was visiting relatives in Colorado uh, not, just like a week ago, and my brother-in-law decides to hold forth um, on his area of expertise, <laughs> which is apparently science fiction. This is what he said, any story said in space. And you know, I just had to put up and shut up, but yeah. <laughs> uh, science fiction is a method it was around long before computer simulations, but it functions in the same way. It's a means by which to test and explore outcomes and develop ideas that are not accessible by everyday thinking. So in science fiction, the author could set up a reality that's altered in some way. She may let the narrative unspool from the premises and follow events to their conclusion. She may run experiments on imaginary worlds and from these experiments extract stories that shed light on our world. It is the mythos of the information age and this is the godmother of science fiction, uh, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein. Um, and science fiction has developed in many directions since then. I like to describe it as a Swiss army knife of literature. And I'm gonna very quickly click through some slides here. I will put these authors up on my website when I get around to it, but here we go, quick. 
Um, what can it do? It can extrapolate from current technology. This is Dreams Before the Start of Time by Anne Charnock. It is about the future of reproductive technology. Very cool. Just out very recently. Nora Jemison's fifth season just won the Hugo Award, and this is a metaphorical exploration of systems of oppression and what they do to us. Nisi Shaw's Everfair is an alternative history of the Belgian Congo. Now this one by uh, Karin Tidbeck, a Swedish author. She takes the concept that language changes reality literally. Uh, this is a really whacked out book. I recommend this one to you guys. <laughs> Cecilia Holland, Floating Worlds, experimenting with alternative political structures. This is a classic. It's been around for, I don't know, 20, 30 years now. Uh, Stephanie Salter's Gem Signs and her, her entire uh, revolution series, which is about altered humans in near future London. And uh, she interrogates classism, racism, a lot of things using the tools of science fiction. This is Liz Jensen's The Rapture, which uh, the author explicitly says is a piece of protest literature against climate change. Uh, and this is a classic by Pat Cadigan. Uh, she does cyberpunk, and all of her work is about the intersection of uh, humanity and technology. Uh, Justina Robson, Natural History. This is post-humanity. Humanity going out into space and changing into really different post-human species. Karen Lord. Uh, Karen Lord's an amazing writer. She's from Barbados. And her, she told me, actually, that her literature is very optimistic about the future because in her culture, um, there's a lot of catastrophe all the time, and so her works are to offer hope. This is my stuff. Um, my work's exploratory. I will just say, I, I use my work more to get under the skin of reality. I, I want to see what's really going on, and I use science fiction as a tool for that. So, science fiction constructs possibility spaces. Its function is to make our thinking more flexible by forcing us to stretch the boundaries of what we think we know. It takes mental agility. It takes open-mindedness. These are qualities that we risk losing as adults. That's why some people think sci-fi and fantasy are for children. But we live in a time of accelerating change. Nobody can afford to stand still. I mean, look at me. I'm doing a PhD, and I'm 49. So I practice what I preach. Yeah. I was, I was afraid I would lose my fob that lets me in the building, so I'm, I'm not taking it off. I, just afraid I'll lose it. Um, so we all need to adapt and change throughout our entire lifetime. We all need mental agility. So long as our lives are intertwined with science and technology, science fiction is relevant and necessary. Look at this, I'm ahead of schedule. To make sense of the world we live in, we need sci-fi now more than ever. Thank you so much for having me. I will put that stuff on my website. Thank you. Yeah.